Hello, hello everyone. We're just going to do a very quick sound test because I've got a new setup today. So just checking the sound. There should be some background music that I've just turned on. And hopefully, is the microphone working? The microphone is working. I'm just going to very quickly tap the microphone. I am so sorry to those of you wearing headphones. I think that's the microphone working. Hopefully it's the right one. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, no background music. We'll just turn that up a little bit. How's that for the background music? I don't want the background music too loud because I am aware that some people don't like the loud background music too much. So, um, everyone, please do feel free to also join in in the chat with your feedback on the sound test. <laughs> right, I think... The background music is good. Okay, I'm I'm just going to turn it down a little bit. If at any point during the stream anyone feels the microphone is too quiet, too loud, or the background music is too quiet or too loud, or something's out of focus, or you can't see something, uh, do just chat away in the chat and let me know. Um, Matthew Ames in the chat is the moderator for today. And I've got a lot of new people joining, so welcome everybody. We'll do a formal introduction in a second. Right, I think that all sounds good. Shall we start? Right. Hello and welcome to a millinery hat making live stream. My name is Ilona. I'm a milliner based in London and today I've got a very full program for you all. Um, <laughs> it's so full, I think we should just jump straight in uh, and make a start because I'm aware I haven't done a live stream for a while. I don't actually know when the last time I did a live stream was. And because it's so packed today, there's a lot of things I want to get through. There's a lot of things I need to do today as well. So I figured I could do them during the live stream. Um, and also I probably don't want to stream for longer than two hours. Three hours will be the maximum today, but even then, two hours is the usual length of these. So do tune in, tune out. 
and obviously this is going to be available afterwards to view on demand as well so don't worry if you can't stay for the whole thing you can come back and catch it later so um i've been busy <laughs> um Hi everyone in the chat. Yes, welcome, welcome Abby, Ruby and Violet. I do love to know where you're all tuning in from. So that's always fun. I'm here in London. I know a lot of my viewers are in America. So if you are in America, do let me know what state you're from. <laughs> it's a very different geography to our little tiny island here in the UK. Um, hi Joanna, welcome. Right. Um, my content's pivoted a bit, hasn't it? You might have noticed there's not been that many tutorials. There, there is one tutorial in the works, definitely. Um, but I did a video about the coronation and that took off a little bit. So I'm still recovering from the shock of that. Um, Ruby says, I'm looking forward to this video because I'm making my own hat to wear at my sister's wedding this Saturday and you are from Memphis. Welcome. Good luck with your hat. I hope you stitch along as we stitch along here all together today. Um, right. So, okay. I've, I've gone off track already. I need to stick to the schedule. So, first off, usually on a live stream, I start by a catch up to, uh, showing you all what I've been working on and there's a lot of hats that I've made in the past couple of months because obviously lead up to Ascot, Ascot big horse racing event here in June, there's a lot of things I would like to talk about about Ascot so I will leave that for another video specifically about Ascot and um, I might even express an opinion on what I think about the whole Ascot thing. But Ascot means hats here in the UK. It just does. So let's see what I've been working on. I don't know if I need to switch camera angles, but let's start on a few. Oh, <laughs> let's start with my favorite hat of the month. The banana hat. Lots of people did not like this one. Lots of people didn't get it. I'll just quickly pop it on. I'm not wearing a hat for the stream like I usually do because I figured I'm going to try lots of hats on today just to show everyone. Here it is. It's so tall it doesn't fit on the screen, but here is the banana hat. Oh, no, away from the microphone. There we go. <laughs> um, lots of people didn't like this one. I can see why. You could class it, well, I mean, it, it is kind of in that area of novelty hats. And novelty hats, people either absolutely love them or completely detest them. And that generally depends on what the novelty is is there's a lot of horse themed novelty hats that get worn to ascot events and personally i am not a fan of those just because they it's a bit too on the nose you know horsey event horse it's a bit too literal for me when i go in for a novelty hat i like to have a very subtle novelty hat so, but which, which maybe defeats the whole point of a novelty hat because a lot of people don't realise that it's a novelty hat. So, for example, this banana, for a start, I made the banana hat because, well, I made the banana because I just really wanted to see if I could make a banana out of cinnamon straw. That was really where this whole project started. And that happened to be at the same time as the coronation in the UK. And coronations are weird, right? I, I don't know how many of the people listening live or watching back on demand are royal fans. Um, and I don't want to upset anyone. I, I'm just going to put it out there straight up front. I'm not a fan, but I also don't mind them. I'm in that category of people who don't really care. I just like the hats that they wear. So there we go, I've said it. I'm not sure if that was the right thing to do in case everyone now comes for me. But this hat was supposed to be a representation of the silliness that is a coronation or indeed any kind of form of British pageantry because British pageantry is weird. It's a set of customs that we have just all agreed to mean something. And that in itself, it, it's a very human thing to do. 
it's we, we've all come together and we've gone do you know what so and so did something on this date in this way therefore this is now a custom like coronations used to have customs like um someone would throw a glove on the floor as a as a gauntlet to challenge the king and then one year that didn't that didn't happen at queen victoria's coronation um so that's when that tradition stopped so the whole country collectively decided do you know what that's a tradition we don't need but we'll keep all the nice robes thank you very much so you see it is silly i hope i've justified that enough um but at the end of the day this was just a funny hat a silly funny hat um worn on the event on the occasion of a very silly and funny event that's generally just very jolly to watch on television because what else can we do right so let's have a look at it close up now that we've gone over the point of the hat so this is what the banana looks like close up there is a video coming on this so do make sure you are subscribed so that you don't miss that one this this will be the next tutorial video if you are here for tutorials and the tutorial isn't just about the banana it's about the base as well so if you're interested in cinema i think this might be oh i think oh i was going to say it's my first cinema video but i think it's my second or third cinema video but either way it's a very interesting way of working with cinema i don't work with cinema straight i work with it on the bias so if you're interested in what that means, that video is coming in the next couple of weeks. So this is the banana up close. I think it's rather cool. Now, I'm probably not going to wear this hat ever again. This hat was made for me. Um, and since I'm not going to wear it again, it would be a shame to just leave it in my cupboard and then it just sits there for the rest of eternity. So I'm going to take the banana off and retrim this base with something a bit more sensible that's not novelty. I like collecting fake fruit and things. That's another reason why I did the banana. I don't have a fake banana in my fake fruit collection. So this will just go into my fake fruit collection, which does just sit in the cupboard doing nothing, but it does bring me joy. So I guess that's the point of that. But this hat I will be re-wearing and it will have a different trim. And what the base of this is, is it's pleats of cinema. So I will be going over how to make that in the video that I've already mentioned. And on the inside, it's got the usual Petersham ribbon. Usually I'd put in a thinner Petersham ribbon, but because I wanted to match the yellow, the only yellow ribbon I had in my cupboard was this wider Petersham ribbon. That's why it's got the wide Petersham ribbon in here. And if you're new here and don't know what these are, I, I think of them as a bit of my signature hat fastening. I put them in pretty much every hat that I make because I like hats to be cemented onto my head. You never know when you're going to want to go for a dance at an event, so you want to make sure that your hat stays on your head. So what I do is I sew in these bits of, um, I think they're called mesh ribbon or veiling ribbon or something like that, or like craft mesh ribbon. Um, and then I stick some bobby pins through it and it tucks it underneath. It's brown because it matches my hair color. If I was to make this for someone who was blonde, I'd put a blonde colored ribbon in and then putting the pins through it, tucks it underneath and hides it and holds the hat down um, with the elastic as well. So two fastenings I think are always better than just one. All right, that's the banana hat. <laughs> oh, was there a small hiccup in the stream? Did we miss much? I don't know what you missed. I'm sorry. I didn't spot the hiccup. Right, next hat. This is also going to be in that video. Let me swap camera angles and just show you what this looks like. This is, I think, turned out to be quite a sensible hat. I wouldn't put this. So here it is. I think it's quite a standard shape. Um, so it's it's a standard shape button which is quite popular you'll see the block i use in the video the the button blocks are generally thought of as being a very good entry point because they're very wearable cocktail hats if you're looking to make hats that are um kind of like party hats so they're not the everyday brimmed hats and um, pillboxes seem to not really be in fashion at the moment, which is weird because I make and sell a lot of pillboxes, but then I don't actually ever see people wearing them. But we'll get on to hats and fashion in a second. I went on a trip to um, 
Was it Fenix we went to, husband, on the weekend? Was it Fenix or did we go to Fortnum's? No, we went to Fenix and we um, we had a look at the hats in Fenix and I have some thoughts on those, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so I've called this one a herringbone patterned button. This is also going to be in the tutorial. Um, I haven't finished the trim, the trim is pinned. Ooh, and the inside isn't finished. And the more hats I put on and off my head is going to um, <laughs> completely destroy my sleek hairstyle. This is the inside, you see it's not finished yet. Um, let's compare it to the inside of the banana, which you see is finished, right? So this is how the hats look unfinished. And this is what magic one ribbon does. It's amazing. It's not even lined, this one, you see. These aren't lined, both of them aren't lined, and the stitches just get lost in the cinema, so I'm not gonna bother lining the second one either. And the trim is this, um, well, this is this is a test trim, this isn't the final trim. Um, I don't like how gauzy it is, I want it to look a little more solid, so I will be remaking this, but this was a test just to see how it works. The trim won't be in the video because the video is filmed and is, is being edited, um, by me tomorrow. So um, you won't see the trim, but you'll see how to make this base, which I think is a very interesting technique. It's just, it's layering cinema, but I want to tell you about how to make it really good because the problem that I have with cinema in general, I've, I've stayed away from cinema as a milliner for pretty much my entire career up until like two months ago until I made the banana is pretty much how long I've stayed away from actually properly exploring cinema so I've made cinema hats like I've made let me get you a hat I've made so I've made hats like this out of cinema but I tend to stay away from cinema for more like traditional shaped hats I just don't like the way it looks but I think I've finally figured out how I like cinema to look, which is quite solid and in these in these kind of button bases. So that's coming and that's, making all these took so long, that's partly why there haven't been tutorial videos for a while and that's why there's been more commentary videos. I hope you guys have been enjoying the um, the commentary videos. Um, should I carry on making them? Are we, are we enjoying the hat fashion side of things rather than just the making? Or are you here for tutorials? Oh, should we do a poll? Let's do a poll. We haven't done a poll for a while. Uh, let's see if I can remember how to do that. Start a poll. Um, which videos do you want to see more of? Uh, we'll go for tutorials. Then we'll say commentary and add an option, both. Oh, get rid of that option and let's ask you guys. So I'll keep that poll up for quite a while. So do respond. I'd like to know which of my style of videos um, you guys are enjoying. Both is kind of an easy cop out. So if if you are really leaning towards one or the other, do let me know. So, uh, right, let's move on to another hat that's coming. Ah, so I, I have posted about this hat. This hat has, this hat is a Patreon video. I didn't want to put it, 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 it came about from the same idea as the banana video in the sense that I wanted to make a base to put the banana on and I was sketching and it just this came out as a sketch I've got the sketches somewhere do I have them I'm surrounded by all my things no nope, the sketches are the sketches are in a sketchbook that's not next to me never mind you'll see the sketches in my in my sketch uh, you'll see the sketches of all these buttons in the video that's coming um, but this one didn't feel right to include in the banana because I think if I'd put the banana on this it wouldn't it just it doesn't make sense Why would a banana belong on a chessboard unless you're having an incredibly long game of chess and feeling peckish? So it didn't make sense. 
So this became a hat, um, a completely separate hat that I finished off. And the way this weaving is done, if you want to find that out, that's on my Patreon. So if you'd like to see that tutorial, you can go and view that. Or if you don't want to sign up to Patreon, I will also be releasing this video as a like pay to view video. So you don't have to pay as much as you would for a Patreon to view it, but you can um, almost like rent the video if you like for, um, for however long you need to watch it for. But that's being sorted out as well. This is another reason why I haven't been making so many videos. There's just too many. Technology takes a long time. <laughs> Technology takes a long time to understand. Um, right, next thing in the hat making. Right, okay, I need your help, everyone. Um, I've been working on this hat. This is another cinema hat. So I was experimenting with understanding how I could, can you see the cinema? It's blocked on the bias. So I was trying to figure out how to trim it because it's a standard button, it's gone a bit flat. This will be a separate video, another one coming. I'm, these days I tend to film a lot of my videos kind of in one go and then spend several months editing them and then they'll be released slowly. So this is why the live streams are quite fun for me because I get to show you what I've been working on without rushing to release a video that's not quite up to my high standards of video editing. So we can chat about these on the live stream. So let me pop this one on. I'm, I'm in two minds about the trim because on the one hand, I think it looks really cute and really sweet, I think it looks. And I've, I've put a veil on it, but I've kind of, chopped the veil down here. It needs a press to, to take it down. I think this is a very interesting way of doing a veil. Um, oh, some questions have come in. Lottie says, is it only on Patreon for a limited period or do you leave the Patreon videos up? Once the video is up on Patreon, it stays on Patreon and you have access to the videos on Patreon for as long as you are paying the monthly membership um, because you can't download the videos from there. Um, and also please don't download my videos because that kind of defeats the point of them being up on the internet. So if you wanted to have access uh, longer for a video, then if you wait, uh, if you wanted to see it literally now, sign up to um, Patreon. But if you want to, if, if you're happy to wait two or three months, I will get round to setting up a section on my website that will contain videos that will be pay-per-view. Um, but I haven't quite figured out how the technology there works. If you don't know, I, I do quite literally run the whole thing pretty much by myself. I mean, um, my lovely husband, Matthew, who is the moderator in the chat, does hold the camera sometimes and deals with some of the really complicated web stuff, as in like, like the really complicated stuff that he does on terminal with a little black screen and he types away and that stuff I don't know how to do. But I do, I did build the website myself and I maintain the website myself and I create new stuff on the website myself as well. So that's why it always takes a little bit longer, especially during the summer months when it's millinery silly season, as I like to call it. Anyway, back to this hat. So my husband, Mr. Hat, we call him here, he thinks that this, this middle bit is weird when you look at it from far away. So I'm not going to show you a close up and I want to know if you all think this looks weird too because I am genuinely in two minds. I've been working on this hat now for three months. One morning I wake up and I think, oh, it looks really sweet and pretty. And then another morning I wake up and I think, no, do you know what, Mr. Hat is right. It is a little bit too weird. So I want to know what you guys think before I show you a close up because Mr. Hat specifically thinks it looks weird from far away. And I think I'm starting to agree with him. Maybe not so much the bow. I think the bow looks nice. This is one of my signature style bows. It's the same style bow that I put on these marvelous macarons. And if you'd like to know how to make one of these, then um, Mr. Hat, could you post the video called Bias Cinema Brims into the chat? and everyone can go and follow that on later. Uh, so that's this hat here. This is called my Marvelous Macaron model. 
Um, incidentally, this one's actually made with offcuts from, from this green. That's why they're the same green. Um, so, the weird thing about this hat might not so much be the bow or the veil, but it's these little tufts of um, stamens. I was just experimenting with dipping cinema ends into... Um, into like a stamen paste. If you've ever made your own stamens, you know what I'm talking about. It's like this toothpaste consistency that you make out of, make out of corn flour and PVA glue and some paint. I was dipping it in and I thought, oh, they look really sweet, um, all, all rolled up together. And then I put them on the hat and I almost think they look a little bit like, the, it does look whimsical, but they do get lost. Like they're, they're just, maybe they're just a little bit too small. I don't know. Maybe I'm struggling to figure out who would buy such a hat. Sometimes when I make a hat, I can really see the person who will buy it, you know? I just, I imagine the type of person who would wear a hat. Is it someone who, by personality type I mean, not by how they look. I like to match hats to personality, not hats to looks. Um, so now let's have a look at a close-up of this. So here's the close-up. You see, close-up, it does look really, really, really sweet. You see? So what these are, is these, this is rolled up cinema. I haven't actually filmed this as a video. Mmm, Julie says, I think if the center of the stamens was more of a pom, less straight up and down. Oh, that's interesting. So, like a, like a whole, like a, like a little, oh, like a dandelion almost. Oh, that would be fun. And Joanna says, I didn't notice the stamen until you pointed them out. Yeah, you see, that's the problem. Mr. Hat, I think that's what you were saying, weren't you, husband? Yeah. Yeah, anyway, I think I'm just going to keep working at it. Maybe this hat just isn't destined to be completed this year. You know, sometimes we can think of hats as pieces of art, and sometimes we can think of hats as, as things to wear. Um, ideally, you'd be thinking about them in both senses. Because if you have a hat that's just a piece of art, then what's the point of it? Then it doesn't have a point. And I'm a modernist and I don't like art that doesn't have a point. Um, but then sometimes if you think of it as an artwork, you know, art, some artists say that their work is never really finished. And I think this hat just isn't quite there yet, conceptually, visually, feeling wise. It's not, it's not exuding the right kind of hat energy. Anyway, um, what else have I been doing? Oh, a few, a few last things, and then we will move on to the hat block unboxing. I've treated myself to some new hat blocks, so I'm, and I haven't opened them yet. They, they came two days ago, and I still haven't opened them up. Uh, so a couple of last bits and bobs of things that I've been working on. And then we can have a quick chat about the Fennec trick at the um, um, husband's and mine trip to Fennec in a couple of seconds. Right, switch cameras. Okay, these are various trims that I've been working on. I have been um, trying to figure out. Oh, there's some questions coming in about. Uh, mm -mm. Uh, Mayuko, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, says, I want to know about Patreon course and how, what's the difference between the beret and the cocktail hat? Um, great question. So the Patreon isn't a course. The Patreon is more, um, so the, the way that I function as a person making videos on the internet, when you view some of my videos on YouTube, most of them, all of them, all of my videos on YouTube are free to watch and I get paid when um, YouTube puts an advert on them because I do need to eat sometimes. Um, and that's how I make money from putting the videos up on YouTube, but that's not enough to cover the whole cost. So I'm actually making videos at a loss to me, but that's fine because I want to make sure that there are free videos out there for people to watch because I think otherwise millinery might die out. 
Um, and the Patreon is for those of you who feel like you would like to contribute to the videos to show your appreciation. So the benefits are listed, but the main benefit to Patreon to you is that if you're working on a specific hat project and you'd like some input from me and you'd like to chat about a very specific project with me, then the uh, lower tier, which I think is uh, whichever is the, the lower, the six pounds a month tier, uh, contact me via Instagram or email and we can chat about your project through pictures or if you're in the higher cocktail hat tier I think it might be or whichever one is the one that's £12 a month um, then we have monthly video calls, group video calls with people in different time zones and we chat about everyone's hat projects together but you can still also contact me personally about hat projects so that's how Patreon works, it's not courses um, and the videos and extra content on Patreon is just an extra little perk that's included in all the tiers. Right, um, there's a lot of chats coming in today and I'm really struggling to read all of them. Um, I know some people are still talking about the green hat. What I'm going to do is I'm going to circle back and read that chat after the live stream because it looks like your input there is actually very, very um, useful and very insightful. So thank you everyone. I'm going to move on to a few more trims. I have been finally getting around to testing out making some little Lily of the Valley flowers, which I was originally going to potentially put onto this hat, but then it was just taking so long. It takes so long to make these little ones. It takes way too long. So I haven't quite given up, but I sort of gave up because it was very time consuming. I will make a whole bunch of these, but I just think the amount of money I'd have to charge someone for putting them on a hat would be so much that no one would pay that ridiculous amount of money. It's much easier to find vintage bunches of Lily of the Valley flowers, if you can, than to try and make them yourself, because this is really fiddly. And if I didn't have, like, really thin fingers and long nails, I don't know how I would do this. <laughs> so, yes, that's an observation. So here they are. They are very sweet, though. And they are therapeutic to make. There is something, it's a bit like crochet or cross stitching or just anything that's just, or knitting, an action that you can just do over and over again without thinking. It is very therapeutic, but time consuming. So that's these little flowers. I think they look very nice when they're just by themselves and not yet attached to a, to a little wire. So that's interesting. Ah. Uh, Next bit. This is a bow I made. I've been experimenting with bows. This is actually a crin bow on the inside. I don't know if that's coming across on the camera. Hopefully that is. That's some crin in there. I think some people call it horsehair, some people call it crinoline, some people call it crin. I call it crin. This one is a vintage crin made out of nylon, so not polyester. So the modern polyester crin is super, super shiny. If you manage to find nylon crin, um, it's not um, it's not as shiny as the modern polyester stuff. In this case, it wouldn't have mattered because I've put it inside a, um, a silk dupion bow. Um, there isn't a video of this. This is just my thoughts. I couldn't get to sleep one night and I thought, oh, I wonder if I can do this with things in my cupboard. So I did. And there it is. I'm quite pleased with it. One is shorter than the other, but they are the same height. Let's quickly chat about the trip to... Wait, no, not Fortnum's. I always default to saying Fortnum's because I like the tea in Fortnum's. Fenix. We went to Fenix because, okay, so um, if you're not in the UK, you might not know what I'm talking about. Fenix is this really fancy posh department store that I don't shop in because it's way too expensive, but it's fun to walk around and pretend like you can shop in it. And they do a whole hat section for the racing season in the UK because, as I, as I already said, everyone wears hats to the races because apparently... The races are a fashion event, but more on that in another video. And I, I, I know I've always wondered about this, and I'm sure many of you have always wondered about this, but when you have a hat on display and you have people try it on and they get makeup all over it, how can you then sell it for full price, like without taking out the ribbon and putting things back in? Well, and now I wish I'd taken some pictures, but you'll have to imagine this. 
when Mr. Hat and I were walking around, I tried some hats on. I really should have taken some pictures. We discovered that on the inside of the hats, they had this kind of tape. And this is, this is from Boots, a pharmacy shop in the UK. It's called Microporous Tape, and it's used to put, um, to put, like, to secure dressings. Like, if you've got a wound, you use this to secure the wound to your skin. Uh, you use this to secure the, the bandage or, or dressing to your skin so that it doesn't move. And this is what was on the inside of hats. So I thought we could pop some on the inside of this hat over here so that I could show you what I saw in the shop. I'm going to need some scissors. I thought this was a mighty clever idea. Because I've, I've heard of, and, and it wasn't stuck on like in one go. It was kind of stuck in, in little sections, but taking care to cover the majority of the band. So like this. So it's almost invisible. Well, I mean, it's it, it, it looks invisible. It looks more invisible on the camera than it does in real life. But I just thought this really is such a useful trick, especially if you're ever doing bridal. Because once you get a little bit of foundation on bridal, on, on white things, oh my goodness, it just does not come out. You can get away with um, dabbing foundation off of Petersham ribbons that are coloured, especially if they're like pastel shades, that tends to be quite easy. But once you get some orange foundation on the inside of a bridal hat, that's it. That has to be a discounted model, or you have to take it apart and redo the... Um, uh, uh, redo the ribbon, redo the petition band. Ah, yes, Mr. Hat says, we need to know if it comes off easily. Do you know what would have been clever if I'd put on one piece of tape and then taken it off? Do you know what we'll do? I'm going to leave this on the hat for the next hour or so, because my big worry would be, does it leave a sticky residue? So I'm going to stick all this down because this is my hat, I don't mind too much because this one's not going up for sale. Um, this is like my sample piece. So we're going to leave this for the next hour and at the end of the stream, I'm going to take the tape off and see if it's left a sticky residue because that would be my worry. Um, mm, mm -mm. Elizabeth Miller says uh, that you call this paper bandage tape. I'm sure it's got many, many names. The stuff that was in the Fenix hats actually had like little porous looking holes in it and this one doesn't, but this was the only one that we could find in a pharmacy. Is we, we saw it in, in the shop and we thought, oh my goodness, we have got to get some of this on the way home and the only pharmacy that there was was a Boots and this is the only thing they had. So we're going to see if that works. Um, Laura, you've got a great question there. Laura's Life says, I'm going to a historical Regency bonnet making workshop ne next week and I was told that trimmings need to be asymmetric and I wondered why. In terms of historical millinery, or historical fashion even, if you if you contextualize it in a modern day, a lot of the things, a lot of the answer to why was a certain fashion this way tends to be because they wanted it that way or because it was just different to what was the decade before. I'm not a historian, but I know that um, just in general, asymmetry is flattering to more people than symmetry. So it could just be a simple like millinery business decision that was made by milliners that said, okay, we want to sell our hats to more people and a wider range of people look more flattering in an asymmetrical hat, like this banana, for example. That's why a lot of people choose to wear hats to one side. There's nothing saying that you can't wear them straight on, but look straight on. You see, I have a, I have one of those faces that is very fortunate to, you know, suit symmetry. And I really like symmetrical hats. That's why a lot of my hats, oops, sorry, I hit the microphone there. 
This is gonna be the problem with the microphone up here is that every now and again, I might hit it with a hat. A lot of my hats are, are, are actually symmetrical because I don't see a lot of symmetrical hats on the market. So I choose to make hats symmetrical a lot of the time as a business decision, but I will also make a collection of asymmetric hats because asymmetric hats do just sell better because they just look nicer. Um, uh, Laughter in the Rain, oh, what a lovely internet name, says, I'm using masking tape to protect the inside of the hat. It doesn't leave sticky bits in on the Petersham and works pretty well. Uh, masking tape would have been my second go-to. My trouble with masking tape is it, I think it depends on the brand. If you found the masking tape that works for you, that's great. But the masking tape that I've always used is like super sticky masking tape and it leaves a sticky residue on my walls. So I, I wouldn't want to use it on a hat. Um, but I guess that the, the really the answer to all of that is if you're going to do something like that, please don't just outright take my word for anything I say. Please test it because you never know if you're using the exact same materials as me or if if like your masking tape or if your microporous bandage tape is going to be completely different to the brand that i use and so it's different uh uh laura you also say i wear my bonnet straight on it's the trimmings that are as asymmetric different ones on each side yeah yeah so it's, it's the same the same kind of principle oh i think this hat needs a little bit of restoration it's spent too long in the um uh thing oh husband i'm just going to correct you because um you're wrong there masking tape and painter's tape are technically two different things <laughs> the only person i will ever properly correct at all times is my husband so i'm sorry about that mr hat I, I've always known painters, painter's tape and masking tape to be two different things because of the way they stick to things, essentially. <laughs> Sorry, husband. <laughs> right, I think... Okay, we, I've gone on for 15 minutes more than I intended. I think I've caught everyone up to everything new, except for my hat blocks. So... I am going to clear away all of the hats off my desk because what the camera doesn't show you is how covered in hats my desk now is. I start very neat with everything in a box and then as I go through the stream, everything comes out of box and goes onto the desk and then I've got to take a quick break to put it all back in the box and then come back with the next box of stuff. So hat blocks, um, I will be unboxing them in literally about two minutes, so don't go anywhere, but you may see an advert. I will see you in two minutes or less.
right, hello everyone. My tea is replenished. I hope everyone else has had a lovely quick tea break. There's some questions that came in that I think are very interesting and I need to answer and I think I need a new pair of glasses because I can't see the laptop that far away. Right, I'm going to attempt to read these, okay. Um, Amoira says, I have a completely random question. Cinema reminds me of burlap in terms of being a type of straw or just a natural material. Have you ever used it to make a hat? Or if not, do you think it would work? So um, most of the materials that I use for millinery will be natural. Um, I think what you want what what you want answered is is what the type of fiber is and whether it's the same same fiber. So it's not the same fiber. Off the top of my head, this may not be correct, but I think burlap is a grass. In fact, um, Mr. Hat, if you could just fact check me, is burlap a grass? I think burlap is similar to hemp and, and those kind of grassy things. Um, and cinnamon is a palm. So if uh, when I say a palm, like think palm tree. And you know those like... Um, if you've ever seen a palm tree up close, it's got those kind of husky things. And the, I I cannot remember if cinnamon comes from those husky things or if cinnamon is from the actual leaves of the palm or something. But if you have unstiffened cinnamon, it's, it's, it's a bit more fabric-y. But the cinnamon that we use for millinery, it's already been stiffened in a, um, in like a PVA type style stiffener. And that's what, that's what makes it so stiff. So maybe you're thinking it's similar just because cinema comes in sheets sheets of a of a of a loose weave um, uh, fabric maybe. Um, the thing is, anything can be a hat material if you stiffen it to the correct extent. So by correct extent, I mean whatever stiffening works for your project. And we'll speak a little bit about stiffening later on when I come to talk about the hat restoration I want to do. Um, Ah, so uh, apparently Bing chat, this is how technologically advanced we are, we're using AI today. Burlap is not a grass, it's a woven fabric made from the skin of jute, plant or sisal fabrics, uh, sisal fibres, which may be combined with other vegetable fibres to make rope, nets and similar products. Yes, I think Bing has slightly misunderstood what I meant by grass. Um, so I, I guess what we need to know is what fiber, this is when AI isn't as intelligent as you think it is, what fiber burlap fabric is made of. I just assumed it would be burlap fiber, which might be a grass. Um, so, and also I think jute still counts as a grass maybe? Anyway, it's, it's okay, it's not the same, burlap is not the same thing as cinema, but um, you can, certainly try and make a hat out of it. It all depends on how you use it and why you're using it and what your finished hat is. Um, some hat projects tend to start as exploration of materials. Some hat projects start as exploration of fashion ideas. Some hat projects are both. So yes, um, have a go. Uh, it's, it's always good to have a go. That's the thing. There's no definite answers in millinery unless you're talking about very specific terminology, which I think if we're speaking terminology, we do want to keep it similar so that we all are speaking the same language when it comes to talking about what things are. This this sometimes gets confusing between British English and American English, because we do have some terms that are different. So I do try and highlight those um, when they come up. And apparently, yes, Jute is a grass, you see. Yes, there we go. And Bing lied to Mr. Hat, so let that be a lesson to everyone. Always fact check your fact checker AI. Right, let's move on to opening some hat blocks. First off, to those of the untrained eye, this may look like a fruit bowl, but it is indeed a brim block. <laughs> no, it is actually a fruit bowl. I saw this in the um, uh, the fruit section, not the fruit section, the kitchenware section of John Lewis, which is a department shop here in the UK. And I thought it looked really, really fabulous. In fact, it reminded me of, um, was it Balenciaga who sent lampshades down the runway? 
it might have been Balenciaga, it might have been someone else, but anyway, someone sent lampshades like this down the runway. And I thought this looked like that. So I thought for winter 2023, 2024, I'm gonna try and block in some felt on this. Obviously it, it will need a, an inner bit because it doesn't have, it doesn't have anything to go in. So my thinking would be block a, block a skull cap essentially in some felt and then block some felt on this stick it together, well, stitch it together, and this will be a very interesting hat. I think it's quite 60s in shape, like you, it, it does look a bit like that kind of lampshade effect, but I also think it can look quite chic, depending on the coat you wear it with. So that's something I'm going to try eventually. So if you can't find hat blocks where you are, kitchen wear sections are great. Ikea is so much fun. If you go through Ikea with the glasses of a milliner on. So if you walk through any kind of homeware shop, um, H&M Home is also quite a good one because they do a lot of stunning vases and some of those vases are just crying out to be hats. So that's always fun. Um, they can be a bit difficult to block on because not everything you can stick into, um, stick pins into. That's why I quite like fruit bowls or, or wooden bowls like this because they're, they're, also, they're also a bit lighter than hat blocks. So if you have any kind of mobility issues or you don't want to be lifting heavy hat blocks, because imagine this as a solid wood thing, it would be very heavy to lift. I've got some that are of a similar size hat blocks that, that are solid wood and it's, it's it, to lift them. If, if I had a back injury or I wasn't supposed to be lifting heavy items, I wouldn't be able to do it. So if you've got some mobility issues, wooden blocks, um, wooden bowls are great for hat blocks. Now let's get to the proper hat blocks because I don't want to put this off any longer. Right, I think my main camera is about to um, lose its battery, but no, it's, it's not quite at battery loss stage yet. So we will very quickly open this and then we will get back to dealing with the camera. So, don't, don't change it now. There it is. I have cut into the hat box, or rather the box the blocks came in. I'm just going to double check that there's no identifying address details. Nope, it's just a piece of um, polystyrene that I don't want to go everywhere. Right. Whoops. Okay, I'll be very careful with that polystyrene. Uh, there is a little thank you note, which is quite sweet and I'm guessing this envelope is what contains my invoice so I'm going to keep that for my business records and this is where oh, ho, ho, this looks fun I might have to stand up and let me let me switch cameras and husband could you now come and, and change the front camera so let's see are we focused here it's always fun buying new hat blocks because it's the kind of thing you have to buy, obviously, online, and you don't always get to go and see them, and then you don't know if they're going to be the right thing. <laughs> so, here is hat block number one. Ooh, that looks exactly like what I wanted. Exactly, exactly like what I wanted. Perfect. I'm going to un-plastic wrap this in a second, because I don't want to get the polystyrene everywhere. But I don't know how else you'd package hat blocks other than in polystyrene, so there we go. In fact, actually, husband, could you bring one of the plastic shopping bags that we keep in the cupboard so I can put the polystyrene in it so the cat doesn't get to it? That would be very useful. The red TK Maxx bags are the ones I'm talking about. And hopefully I haven't got any polystyrene in my tea. That would be tragic. All right, let's get the polystyrene in the bag safely out of the cat's way. Yeah, leave that there for me, thanks. 
You see, when one edits an unboxing, it's a lot more fun because it's fast paced. A real time unboxing is a little on the slow side. Right, block number two. Do you know, I ordered these, because obviously they're handmade to order, I ordered them a while back and now I can't quite remember exactly what I ordered. Ah yes, no no, this is, this is what I ordered, yes. Yes, I got a little round, uh, like a, a larger button beret block, because I think this is going to go down quite well in the winter. Right, so now I can get rid of the polystyrene laden box. Right. Wonderful. No more polystyrene. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't as exciting as I thought it would be, but we can unwrap the hats now from the plastic casing. Let me just double check that I'm in focus. There we go. And what I'll do is I'll, I like to save these kind of plastic bits of packaging because if you're ever finding that you need to paint some silk or something or stiffen some silk flat, which I'll be talking about later, these plastic bags are great for protecting your table surfaces. So I always try and reuse the plastic packaging if, if anything I order comes in plastic pa packaging. So this is a um, block from Guy Morse Brown. It's the CB203 model. And it is this little percha teardrop shape. So if I pop that on my head, it's kind of like this. It's quite a classic shape. You see a lot of hats made in it um, in, in this sort of style, not necessarily this specific block but I thought I wanted to treat myself after having quite a successful year. Um, so I wanted to reinvest the YouTube money into some hat blocks that I can make. And obviously I will block something on this, maybe live at some other point, maybe closer to the winter, because I've got so many other hats on the go at the moment, I don't actually have time to make anything with this, but I think it's going to look really really nice. I always really like the quality of the Guy Morse Brown hat blocks. This isn't sponsored, there's plenty of other hat block makers off the top of my head. There's Guy Morse Brown, there's um, Boone and Lane who I want to investigate later on in the year for a custom hat block commission. Uh, there's a couple of other ones and I cannot remember their names off the top of my head but um, the internet is your friend. If you're looking for some blocks have a look, you might have some block makers local to you. Block making is a, um, it's on the endangered crafts list here on the UK. Um, so if you can afford to buy quality wooden handmade blocks, do support them. Um, their work is very important because if it wasn't for the block makers, we wouldn't be able to make all our wonderful, lovely hats. <laughs> all right. The next one is a round button block. So I haven't really ever been a fan of buttons or very symmetrical round hats. And that's because very symmetrical round hats don't actually sit very comfortably on the head. So what I mean by symmetrically round, I mean they're not an oval shape. Um, so if you were to take an imprint of, our, of, of your head, it's actually an oval. That's why a lot of hats are oval and not round. And when you do some hat blocks, you tend to see some, some can be fully round and those shouldn't really be made without squishing them into an oval a little bit. Once you block your hat on a round hat block, just squish it in, make it an oval. It'll make it much more comfortable to wear. Um, which is why I was put off purchasing one of these um, earlier on in my millinery career. I know this is what a lot of people start with because these are quite fun 
small hat and fun small hats are fun to make fun to wear and quite easy to sell so that's why a lot of people start with these i've done things the wrong way around as i usually do and i started at the complicated end of the spectrum trying to come up with my own shapes and now i've reached the stage where i've gone do you know what let's see what all the fuss is about and why people love all of these blocks so much and it is indeed because it's much easier to work on blocks like this and to design for blocks like this because when you're designing for a block like this, most of the hat is more about what shape can you create in the trim rather than what I would call a traditional vintage millinery approach, which is more about what 3D shape can I create in general around the head. And it's nothing to do with hat blocks or anything like that. It just depends on how you think. Again, there's always so many different ways of doing millinery and it's all about what makes you happy what makes you feel the most creative and what you want to be doing with your time. So those are my two new blocks. Oh, I should say what model this is. This is also Guy Morse Brown. That's CB53. Um, let's pop it on my head just so you can see what it looks like. So obviously because it's got the middle section, it's not going to sit flush on my head. Um, this is how I would wear a plain one of these. So I, Think of it like a mini beret to start with. Um, mm, uh, sorry, I can't read your name. Tiare, I hope that's the right way to pronounce that. Tiare says, are they worn at the back of the head then? So they, they can be worn whatever way you want them to be worn. This is what I always say about hats. It's or about the blocks, right? So um, definitely with the blocks, make the block work for you. Don't be a slave to the block. There is no right or wrong way to use a hat block. You use the hat block however you want to use it, however you want to design your hat. If you want to use this as a round pillbox that sits on the back of the head like this, you go ahead, you do that. That, that actually looks really, really quite nice. I might try that. Um, if you wanted to wear it like forwards like this and stand it upright, like um, Philip, Philip Tracy does a lot of this kind of stick it on the front of the head thing. I think he thinks it's very futuristic. I'm inclined to disagree, but um, <laughs> uh, I probably wouldn't wear this one straight on because what you can see is um, it's a lot wider than the top circumference of my head. Um, so I would, probably wear this one like this. And in fact, when I block on this, what I will probably do is when I put a wire in, squish it in a little bit, just give it a slight little arc on the front and it'll be so slight that no one will realize you've done it, but it will sit so much more comfortably on the head. Um, but that's something to experiment with when I come to blocking on this. Um, Kat has asked, how many blocks do I have? And uh, Mr. Hat has replied, so many. I'd like to point out, I don't have as many blocks as one would potentially expect um, a professional milliner to have. Uh, that's partly because I work from home and I store all my blocks in the linen cupboard. <laughs> um, if you've seen my home tour um, video from, from years ago, I, I think it's a little bit cringy to watch right now, but, um, you know, it's on the internet so you can seek it out and, and you can find my home tour video. You'll see how I store my blocks. There are a lot more blocks now than there were in that video. Um, but I try and use, so a lot of milliners, if, if they're making head sized hats, they'll have a block that's the, the head block that's the size for every different head and then they'll have the brim that's the size also for every different head and you also get differently shaped blocks if you've got a more oblong head or if you've got a rounder head um so traditional hatters that make proper hat hats um like the ones mr hat wears their blocks will be very varied and they will have a lot of them in comparison to studios like that i don't have that many blocks I like to think I have a healthy amount of blocks because I've got, I've got about five, what I would call small style shapes like this. I've got um, a custom pillbox that I made, another smaller version of like a 60s uh, button pillbox hybrid 
crossbreed thing. So now I've got these extra two, so that takes me up to four. And then I've got the button block. I've got a halo and a bandeau. This is off the top of my head. And then I've got two types of crown block. I've got an open crown block and I've got a dome crown block in, in and they're different sizes. And then I've got about four or five brim blocks, but um, you do not need all those things to start in millinery. Please don't waste your money and go and buy 20 blocks before you've even made your first hat. Pick one shape and stick to it. The shape I started with was a pillbox. Everything I made, um, and, and a callow half hat, which you can make on a poupe head. So when I started, I started with a poupe head. Um, shall we play husband bring the hat block? That's always our favorite game on the live stream. Husband, I need you to bring me two blocks. I need you to find the um, small button block that I keep talking about, just for a size comparison with this one. I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about. It looks like this, but smaller. And I need you to bring me Anne, who is, I think, in the hallway. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so while husband does that, um, let me get back to talking about blocks and what I would recommend. Pick a shape and stick to it, essentially. There is so much variation that you can push yourself to creatively create from just one shape. So if you don't know where to start, think to yourself, what, what hats, what shapes that you see make you happy what hats do you see yourself wearing because are you making these that's Cece that's not Anne <laughs> I think that's the first time husband's ever got it wrong <laughs> um so I've if, if you're wondering what I mean by that uh with the the head names I've given all my actual heads names so Anne is the fabric covered one that's Charlie <laughs> All right, third time lucky husband, you've only got one option left because Edna's in this room. Is Anne, no, she she should be standing up right, no? Oh, okay, Anne's gone AWOL. Oh, do you know what? I think I know where Anne is. You won't get to Anne, don't worry. Don't worry about Anne. Okay, I can't show you a poopy head today because Anne is hard at work holding a hat on her head. Um, This is a tiny button block. <laughs> we'll come back to uh, the reality of life and not up in millinery weirdness. Right, so this is the difference. This is a larger button. It, it's like a button beret, I would call it. So this is the one I ordered. And this is a tiny... Oh no, wait, no, that's also not a button block. Never mind, husband got it wrong twice today. This is a button pillbox. Doesn't matter, it's the same size as the button block. But the button pillbox has more of a... The, can you see this edge? It's got this kind of sharp edge. Whereas a button is, well, it's what this was blocked on. And you see this doesn't have that, that sharp edge. Here's the difference. You see how the size is the same? But the edge, this one is curved and this one stops and then domes. So that's what I would call a button pillbox. And this is what I would call just a standard button. Some people call this a smarty as well. I haven't figured out what the difference is between a button and a smarty, but one day I will, and then I will let you all know what I think it is when I've sort of figured it out. Right, well, that's all the hat blocks. Has anyone got any more hat block questions? Because I would like to move on to talking about vintage hat restoration. Um, if no one's got any more questions, I'm. Uh, if you do have questions, I'm going to pop to a quick break so that I can once again switch out all my table gear. And um, during the break, type your hat block questions into the chat and I will answer them when I will be back in about one minute or so and you might see an advert.
Welcome back, everybody. I realise my hair is looking a bit messed up because I've put on so many hats and taken so many hats off. I'm going to put a vintage one on in a second. Uh, so welcome back. I've had a much needed tea break. If I talk for longer than about an hour and a half, my throat does start to get tickly, but it's fine. I'm doing fine. I'm also very, very warm because I can't have the windows open. Otherwise you'll hear all the trains outside my window. And that won't be good for the audio. There were some questions that I've missed, so I'm going to scroll back a bit in the chat and just answer some previous questions before we dive into vintage hat restoration. Um, I'm so sorry if I've missed some, some questions today because um, a lot of new people have tuned in, so welcome everyone who's new. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, and I do apologize if I've missed your question. And if I still haven't answered your question by the end of this video, um, just leave me a comment um, once the video goes live as a video to view on demand and then I'll answer it in the comments section in a couple of days time when I come back to it. So um, I, I don't mean to ignore anyone. So if you've got a question, pop it for me in the comments um, afterwards if I don't answer it. There was a interesting question I was looking for. Yes, so a while back, Callie says, for important events, do ladies bring in their dresses or a photo of fabric swatch to a shop for a hat to match? Or would the hat be sold at the clothing designer shop or both buy together? So it depends. Um, it's It depends on what the shop is or who the milliner is or what's going on. So if you think of very high-end milliners that do pretty much exclusively made to order, I'm or or like um yeah just just the hats when you see a hat that is so perfectly matched to a dress that it can only have been made to order or have been a very fortunate shopping experience that would have been um several fittings and try-ons with the milliner when people have bought their dresses in physically um it's very difficult to match to a photo I appreciate that. I tend to do, um, and, and that's a very high-end model. Uh, the low-end budget model would be in department shops, like for example, John Lewis at this time of year, there's a um, hat section. Do you know, now that I'm saying all this out loud, I'm thinking this would have been a very good vlog and maybe this is something to do next year, husband, if we're still filming videos for um, just, just taking some, some shop tours around millinery shops and millinery displays in the lead up to Ascot. So we'll write that one down in the notebook to do this time next year because we sort of missed the window this year. Um, so the, the lower end of the hat spectrum, you've got shops like um, uh, John Lewis, which is a department shop, which will have lots of different dresses. And at the kind of center of the dress department, they have a seasonal wares department. And in, in that section, they will put lots of hats in for Ascot and wedding season. And those hats, um, they're usually designed, they are designed by professional milliners, but be, to keep the price point cheap at about, you know, 80 pounds a headpiece, they will be made in China or places like that using materials that aren't maybe of the best quality they won't be matched to hair colors, they won't be matched to dress colors, they'll just be in an array of seasonal colors. This year I've been seeing a lot of um, powdery blues and a lot of hot pinks. Those two seem to be the big colors in the cheaper department stores this year. And I'm very aware that when I say cheaper end and I say 80 pounds, it doesn't sound right. And yes, unfortunately, that's just because hats are expensive items in themselves. So whilst you can find a dress for about 20 to 30 pounds, maybe if it's on sale with headpieces and hats, even when they're mass produced in China, they're still at the expensive end of a budget. And that is, is a subject for a whole other video about how crazy modern life is with prices and everything that everyone is dealing with. I mean, I, I'm not sure what the world economic situation is, but here in the UK, it's not looking good. Um, so I do appreciate that we are in a little bit of a, 
a hat couture bubble where I'm here going on about, oh, I've bought these hat blocks and oh, I'm selling these hats for 150 pounds and, and a lot of people are struggling and it doesn't always sit right with me. But then you've also got on the other end of that, the fast fashion and how can a dress cost only 20 pounds when actually clothing should be worth a lot more if it's made with care and good factory conditions. Anyway, I've I've gone off on another tangent. This is this is not the subject of today's live stream. <laughs> I I can I can discuss that on another maybe dedicated live stream if people are interested to hear about that. Um let's move on to to happier things. Let's move on to vintage hats. Um I hope I've answered your question, Callie. Sorry, I went off on a on a social political economical tangent there, but you can't really it's difficult to isolate hats from fashion economics, I'm afraid. Um, I, ooh, I, I guess I could answer the question by saying what, what it, it, it comes down to a business model. And the business model that I tend to do is I sell a lot of hats on the internet and I provide people with extensive photos of uh, swatch samples. So if you're interested in how I sell my hats, just visit my website and have a look at my... Um, uh, ready to wear and made to order hats because they are slightly different types of hats. Some some can be made to order, some are already made and can be bought. So if, um, oh, and then I also do pop-up shops and I have a pop-up shop coming up. So if you're in London actually, and you'd like to come and say hello, um, wave at me and try on some of my hats or just come and chat hats to me, I'm going to be in, um, husband, could you pop the address into the chat actually? It's the, it's, the shop called Sook in, I think it's New Malton Street, and I will be there from Thursday the 8th till that Sunday. So husband, if you could just pop that in the chat. If anyone is in London, come and, come and say hello. I, I love meeting everyone in real life because do, do we all really exist if it's on the internet? <laughs> I mean, of course we do, but come and say hello if you're around. Um, yeah, so my business model is to keep the prices low. I don't have a physical shop, so people can't really bring me dresses. Um, I've had several people ask for appointments, but then no one ends up booking an appointment. And I tend to send people samples in the post and then they pick the colors that they like and then they send the samples back to me so that I can send the samples back in and out, in and out. Um, right, vintage hats. And take a sip of tea. Hmm. Vintage hats, vintage hats. Um, we're already an hour and a half into the live stream, so I'm not going to be able to get as far with the vintage hat as I wanted to. But we'll get, we'll, we'll we'll dismantle it a little bit and see what's going on because this is a this vintage hat requires some dismantling, so that we can then retrim it with remade trimmings in the same spirit as the original design and then probably put a new ribbon in it. Anyway, let's have a look at the hat. Here is the vintage hat. I've tried it on in some of my other live streams. I'll put it on my head in a minute, but this is, I still haven't quite figured out what type of straw this is, but let's give you all a view of what this hat looks like. It's all the flowers are very flat. It almost looks like the way it's been stored, someone's just popped a load of tissue paper on it and just flattened those flowers down. But the actual structure of the hat is in pretty good nick. So that's always a good thing to look out for. If you're vintage shopping for hats, choose structural in integrity over beautiful trimming because you can always take the trim off and retrim it, but restoring structure is a little more advanced than taking off a trim and popping it back on. So that would be my advice. Uh, oh, sorry everyone, just checking the, just checking the live stream settings. No, I think we're all good. We're all still going. Wonderful. Um, right. The trim on here is a mixture of waxed or lacquered leaves. I can't quite tell. Um, some Petersham ribbon flat bows in a thin-ish millinery ribbon. I think this is a 1.5 millinery ribbon. 
uh, and then it's got all of these leaves around the outside. The straw, I cannot quite tell what it is. I'm going to have to pop my glasses on so that I can take a really close look. Um, so I thought this was crocheted because it looks crocheted. Um, but it's not. I think it's stitched. I think what it is, is it's a crocheted straw that's been crocheted into a strip and then it's been stitched like you would with Milan straw or, you know, straw that comes in strips, essentially. That's why I think it looks like a crocheted hat, but then you can also see the stitches running through it. So it's been sewn in the round, but I don't know. I've never seen a hat material like this before. I've only seen it on this one vintage hat and it looked so lovely that I didn't want to miss the opportunity to just, you know, get it. <laughs> so here it is. Let's have a look at the inside. On the inside, it's got the Petersham ribbon. This is a standard, oh, and it's got some stamens from the inside. Oh, there might be some more in there. Hang on, let's shake it out. Oh, there's another stamen. <laughs> this must be from other hats in the shop that might have just gotten confused inside it. So here it is. It's got the Petersham ribbon. It's got a plastic comb, which is actually really sharp. Like, I'd, I'd prefer a metal comb over this kind of vintage... Um, plastic comb. I'm, I'm definitely going to take this off and, and put a different comb in it. I actually don't think it needs the comb and I'll pop it on my head and show you why in a second. It almost looks like that was a later edition by someone who owned the hat and the brand here it says Charmer which um, when I think of a brand that's Charmer I think of a, a cheese called a Sussex Charmer. Not, not hats but there we go. Um, maybe this looks a bit like a like a cheese wheel. I don't know why. I've, I've never heard of this brand before. I just it was in a charity shop. Um, not in a charity shop. It was in a vintage shop. It looked nice, so I bought it. Um, so that's the general hat. Let me pop it on my head and show you what it looks like. It's a very interesting shape. So comb goes at the front, even though I'm not going to put the comb on. So... I would probably wear it with a little bit of a tilt like this. I think my bun's a bit too big for this hat. I would have ideally just worn it a little bit further back like this. I think it looks quite nice. It's a very interesting shape. There it is. You see, it's, it just looks flat. The shape in itself is great, but the trim, it, it very much needs to be taken off and redone. And that was the plan for today, but we've only got about half an hour left, so, um, new plan, I'm going to take off some of the trim so that we can have a look at it and then I'm going to talk you through um, the restoration process that I'm going to do and then maybe we can do a follow-up live stream. Um, I don't want to promise a date because June weekends are looking very busy because of height of summer in the UK so everyone wants to be out and, and see each other so I've I might have quite a full calendar, but we'll see when we can fit another live stream in because I don't I don't want you guys to miss out on on this hat restoration. I want to do it all during a live stream, so I don't want to be working on it and not showing you guys the process. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do now that I've assessed where this hat is lacking things, what I would do normally is take up a lot of pictures because once you take a hat apart, you can't put it back together, so I'm just going to take some pictures now. Usually what I'd also do is, is, is kind of film around it as well, so that I get a full 360 view. The pictures are so that I can zoom in on details once I've taken it apart. But then what I will do is I will take a video and spin the hat around. From the different angles. Of course, this will depend on your restoration and what you're doing. If you are thinking of completely retrimming the hat with a new trim, this isn't strictly necessary. 
but I thought that this hat was particularly fun as it was, so I want to restore it to its original design. Right, that should be enough of that. I haven't taken pictures of the inside yet, so we'll do that. A picture and a video of the inside. And then I'll probably also take some pictures and videos as I go along as well. I hope this is useful information to everyone. I'm very aware I'm just surrounded by cameras being filmed and then using a camera myself and potentially just staying a little bit too quiet. So I hope everyone can just bear with me. Once you start taking a hat apart <laughs> and you can't remember how it's gone back together, that's a problem if you're trying to do a faithful restoration. Right, that should be enough pictures and things for me. Whilst we're here, I also want to talk about something that I keep seeing again and again in a lot of vintage hats that we don't see these days in modern hats. Modern hats start to kind of go to the super end of super, super couture and therefore expensive because of the time that it takes or super, super, super cheap and therefore glued together or put together in factories in China, but you still can't see any stitching anywhere. Vintage hats, there was this mid-range category because when everyone wore hats, if you think about it, you, you, you want to be able to buy products at every kind of income level. So if you're kind of lower middle class range of, of income in the 40s or 50s and you've got enough money to buy yourself a new hat twice a year, which was what the adverts would have you believe was the average rate of buying a hat in the 40s and 50s. About two hats a year, an, an Easter bonnet pre-summer and then a new hat for the winter, or you'd retrim and things like that. But generally, maybe you're buying yourself one hat a year or two hats a year. A bit like a pair of shoes, like a, like a sturdy pair of walking boots. How often are you buying one of those? If, if you're middle class, you're going to want the mid-range stuff. So. That's what a hat like this would have been, because it's kind of put together in a very cheap and cheerful way. Um, the band is stitched by machine, so you can see the machine stitches there on the Petersham ribbon. That's easy to take out. But this is the interesting thing, to me anyway. You can see all the stitching on the inside where the trim is being held in place. They're not little neat tie tack stitches, they're great big travelling stab stitches. The milliner that's put this together is not concerned about someone being able to pick up the hat, looking on the inside and going, ah, I can see the stitching. Isn't that an awful thing to see? No, we're not Victorian anymore. We don't mind seeing the stitching in the, in the 40s and 50s when hats are being produced at um, a higher rate and people want to wear them. But these days we seem to have lost the idea that it's okay to see the stitches. So I'd like to bring that back if I can. So some of my hats I am rebelliously not lining. <laughs> but I don't think I'm brave enough to quite show stitches quite like this yet, but I'm going to build up to that and hopefully make it okay to show stitches just so that we can keep the price of the hats down a little bit because if we want more people to wear hats we've got to keep the prices in line with what people can afford to buy. Anyway, that's how my brain thinks. So that's my rant on stitches over. Oh, another interesting thing from the inside of this hat. It has a wire on the inside. Now, I would have, if I was making, if I designed a hat like this and I was thinking about how to reinforce it because it, it's, it's very, very soft. So it does need something and it's got a very thin wire in it. In fact, we can measure the thickness of the wire. Calipers, let's see. How thick is this wire here? It doesn't feel like it's... Yeah, it's, it's one millimeter, I think. Yeah, I'm gonna call that a one millimeter wire, which is the kind of wire that you generally use for flower making. Luckily, I have some. Um, I don't think the wire needs redoing though. 
and the wire is stitched in with a v-shaped stitch which i actually don't know how to do but i've seen it in a lot of textbooks and it looks very interesting um and i haven't had the time to learn it yet one day i'll learn how to do this type of stitch because i think it does look very very delightful but on the inside of that wire it is hang on let me see if i can flip it up does it have it oh no sorry i'm thinking about a different hat nope it's just a wire on the inside here yep yeah. Uh, so if I go back to talking about the wire, um, sometimes I would have thought to myself, okay, well the wire should go right on the edge because that's generally what I would do on a pillbox. So I don't make fitted pillboxes. I make pillboxes in a standard 52 centimeter size, which is two centimeters less than my head circumference. And my head circumference is tiny at 54, but then my hats are geared towards people with smaller heads. I cater to the small head size spectrum of the population. So I've, I've created this niche for myself. I do small head hats. So that's why all my hats can be seen quite small because I make them for small heads. Um, and I would normally put a wire on the outside edge, but on this hat, I think it's very interesting that what they've done is they've put the wire on the edge of the straw, but then the straw is tucked under about uh, two centimeters from the edge. So in fact, the wire is at two centimeters in. I just thought that was a very interesting treatment of a straw and I might try and implement this in another design whenever I have another idea of something to do. Right, let's get back to taking this hat apart because I need to know how many of these flowers there are. And these flowers are also set in a very, very interesting way. Mm, so I'm going to need my box of things um, with an unpicker. Oh, the unpicker is here. So hopefully this box contains everything I need for the project and I will go through it one item at a time when we get there. So when I work on hats, I like to keep all the projects in little boxes because it means I can have about 10 to 20 hats on the go because you know, orders come in. And then when I'm working on some personal stuff or some stuff for YouTube, nothing gets confused. Everything is in its little box and I can just wake up one morning and say, okay, today I'm working on box number one. Tomorrow I'm gonna work on box number five and oh, box number 10 needs to be sent off tomorrow. So I need to package it up. So that's how I tend to work. Right, with the unpicker, uh, some of this stuff is glued on, some of it is stitched on, which I think is also very interesting in terms of treatment. I'm going to start going from the top downwards. There is some glue residue on the outside of the straw, so I will have to see if it's worth picking it off. Or sometimes with vintage hats, you will start to think, oh, well, I might as well just not touch that bit. Because sometimes if there's a bit of dirt on a hat and you can't get it off without denting the shape, better to leave the dirt there because you won't see the dirt as much as you'll see a dent, for example, in some cases. Right, so that's the little bow. You see, this is where the glue is. It's right there. I might be able to pick that off with some pliers. Let's see. Nope, I'm going to need to do it with some tweezers, so I'm going to do that later, if I even get to it. Right. What I'm going to do is leave these little ones on for now, these bows and leaves, because I think they're nothing to do with this central bit. So let's see how this central bit is attached. And that was all of this stitching on the inside. And some, some of it is glued on. So this flower here is glued on. So with glue, you can either steam it off and risk denting the shape, or you can very gently peel. And it's up to you which method you choose. I'm going to not peel that anymore at this moment in time. It's, I, it's so fascinating to me the way this hat is put together because you'd think 
if, if it was all stitched or all glued, it would make sense in my brain as to how someone put this together. But it almost makes me think like maybe someone bought the shape and bought the trim and put it together themselves. I don't know. Oh, this trim is interesting on the underside. This is, this is, yes, I, I will get to it in a second. Trust me, you will be blown away by how this trim is put together. Right, we're getting there. Oh, it's interesting. Well, maybe it was bought as a hat that was stitched together and then someone wore it so much that the leaves started falling off and instead of stitching them down, they glued them down because there's weirdly big dollops of glue in places and then in other places where you'd think, okay, if there's a dollop of glue under that leaf, there should be a dollop of glue under the other leaf and there just isn't. <sighs> See, this is this is why I don't like glue and millinery. If you glue down your trims, you're not going to be able to re-trim. Right, we're almost there. Can you see what's going on here? This is fascinating. At least it's fascinating to me. I really don't want to ruin this hat by... This is why I don't like glue. This is why I don't like glue. Okay, right, we're safe. So this is now what this hat looks like without most of the trim. You can see where the, oh, there was some dust under, under the trim. That's how old this hat is. I estimate it's mid fifties. Um, you see, look, dollop of glue right there. That's holding the thread. Oh no, there we go, the threads come out. I don't want to pull on all the threads right now because some of them will be holding these bows and I'm not removing the bows right now. Okay, right. I'm going to set this hat aside. Today we won't have time to go through the rest of this hat. I think this one came from the top, so I'm just going to remind myself that this was at the top of the hat. So you've got almost north, south, east, west, and then another bow and leaf at the very top. So that can go to one side for next time and the hat can be put to one side for another time as well. And let's have a look at this trim. It's on a ring of pipe cleaners. Isn't that genius? And I happen to have some pipe cleaners in the flat, so I will be utilizing them. We've actually been using pipe cleaners to clean out the cat's water fountain, but I'm glad I've found an actual craft use for the pipe cleaners. I always thought pipe cleaners belong in the realms of children's projects, but you know what? If, if people are using them on vintage hats, then why not use them on a hats today? Right. So how is this? This is one long pipe cleaner and it's been put together with some more wire. Over here. So there's some wire that's been coiled around holding this pipe cleaner together. Now, if I wasn't thinking of recreating this trim, I would just put this to one side and start working on a new trim, but I'm going to take it apart in what I think the order would have been of putting it together. Um, and I can't quite see how the leaves and flowers are attached. I have a feeling it's glue. And I'm trying to figure out right now if the pipe cleaner and flowers would have been a long pipe cleaner with flowers on it and then put into the round or whether the circle was created first and then the flowers were put on top. The closer I can get to the original, to understanding the original method of construction, the better my restoration will look. But again, that's only relevant if the aim of the restoration is to get close to the original 
or if you're recycling a vintage hat for parts, this wouldn't matter at all. But if you're looking to learn some techniques of millinery and you can't find any courses near you, this is a great way to get into millinery. So apart from, we've already spoken about having some small blocks, decide on one shape and stick to it. Um, a way to teach yourself millinery, and I am largely self-taught from books. And in fact, the whole point of my channel is um, when I started making videos, I was thinking to myself, back to when I was a beginner, what would I have wanted to see? So you, you can almost watch my videos in order from the very beginning up to now and see my progress. And that's, that's what the point of the channel is, is to document my process and, and show everyone how millinery happens. Okay, considering there's a spot of glue there under all the flowers, I think I can deduct that the pipe cleaner was put into the circle first and then the flowers attached on top. So I don't want to lose the size of this as a pipe cleaner because I'm going to want to refer to this later. You see, look at that glue holding it all. Peel that away. What I'm going to do is find a pen. In fact, I'm going to just, uh, oh, husband, could you come and grab a Sharpie for me? Or maybe some pins. Some pins would be useful, actually. Some pins and some Sharpies. Mr. Hat, you are needed. Unless he's fallen asleep. No, there he comes. Right, um, I didn't quite prepare too well. You're gonna have to duck him. Just, just walk across. No, nope. okay, no, he doesn't want to be on film. Uh, yes, I'd like that box, and I'd like the glass-headed pins with the multicolours. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I want to mark on this pipe cleaner where it was joined. And because I'm not gonna use it again, I'm going to use a Sharpie. Obviously don't use a Sharpie on things that will be visible if you're going to reuse them. But this is now for all intents and purposes, a sample piece. So I'm just going to mark on with black. That's where one join was, and it was joined to this one at this bend. Okay, so now when I come to measure the pipe cleaner later, I know what the distance was. Right, let's see what happens when we straighten this out. Here it is. This is quite a nice way to treat flowers, isn't it? It's quite interesting. I'm going to unbend it. And it's also much lighter than using millinery wire. So I did figure out that the flowers were on some kind of wire. So I've got my millinery wire next to me thinking it was probably millinery wire, but I think this is much lighter than a millinery wire, the pipe cleaner. And it disappears in the white. You can't really see it. Now the trouble with a pipe cleaner, and I think you can see that over here, you can see the, well actually that's glue residue, but the other problem with a pipe cleaner is this kind of brownness. If that was anywhere else, you'd think it could be um, rust. Rust is a big problem with metal and vintage hats. I um, ordered a job lot of millinery supplies from the US and some of it had rusty millinery wire and it was bright orange and it had got onto some other things and it's possible to brush the rust off but you want to prevent hats from rusting really so that's why we use cotton covered millinery wire because the wire is covered in the cotton and it shouldn't rust through the cotton but with pipe cleaners you don't have that so you do have the problem of potential rust laura says what is your favorite material to block cinema felt straw or buckram Ooh. To block, mm, okay, well, I don't like working with cinema. We'll just, we'll just put that one out there. Yes, I know I've just done a whole load of buttons and I'm about to release a whole load of cinema videos, but I hate working with cinema. I find it really hard on my fingers. Um, I ended up with scratched up hands after working with cinema because it's really tough. 
Um, what were my other options? Felt. Oh, felt. I find felt hit and miss. I don't like that you have to stiffen felt with chemicals, and I know you can stiffen it with non-chemical stiffeners, but I've never found that to work very well. Chemical stiffeners have worked best for me, and I don't, I don't enjoy that aspect of working with felt. And I also don't like to work with pre-stiffened felts because I like to control the stiffness. So I wouldn't say I like felt either. And also felt is a lot of work. Blocking felt is like going to the gym every day. Just so much like physical effort in, in the arms. You, you get quite strong when you block a lot of felt hats with all the, all the pushing and pulling you do with the felt. Um, straw, I don't think I've made enough straw hats to have an opinion on straw. That's something I haven't quite had the time to explore yet. I've gone on a very slow learning journey. Um, so I started with Buckram. Um, when I told one millinery tutor on a course that Buckram is where I started, she looked at me and she said, oh my goodness, you're crazy. Buckram's really hard. You've started at the deep end. Um, but I've always found Buckram to be really satisfying. I think there's so many possibilities that you can do with Buckram. And I really like fabric covered hats. I prefer fabric covered hats to almost anything else. I love the feel of velvet and velvet sits so nicely on Demet covered buckram. So I guess buckram would be the short answer, um, but maybe not for the reasons you might think. <laughs> okay, back to the hat restoration. Otherwise we won't get anywhere. We're going to get a bit blue Peter in the second with um, here's what I made earlier type scenarios. Let's have a look at how these flowers are positioned. So you've got these waxed flowers. I can't figure out if this is waxed or if, it, if it's lacquered. I guess the way to find out would be is if, um, I don't think there's any salvaging these. They do look very, very old. So I will probably subject them to some heat from the iron and see if the lacquer melts or, uh, well, if this coating melts, it's probably wax. If nothing happens to it, it's probably lacquer. I don't recommend you do that at home because you don't know what these things could be and you could end up with a lot of fumes and gases being given off by heating these things. So when I do things, when I experiment with trying to figure out what material something is or what chemical something's covered in, I do do it in a ventilated laboratory condition so that it's all safe. And if you don't have those conditions to work in, don't go try and figuring out what things are because a lot of old millinery is known to have used very dangerous chemicals and things in the dyes and you know they say um as mad as a hatter that comes from mercury and stuff i mean this this isn't going to have mercury in it but the, just just you know millinery is known for bad chemicals so always be careful um so i will test that and see what that is and I think you can still buy vintage flowers and things. I like to go and thrift around. We have a local vintage market here where I live once a month. So I do like to go and thrift around there. They do have a really lovely haberdashery store that I pick things up from every now and again. So maybe they'll have some leaves next time they're around and I can pick some up. And then I don't have to worry about making these. Now with the flowers, I do want to try and remake these because that's just fun, isn't it? We all love flower making. Flower making is a very fun hobby. And what I did earlier today, because I was I, I was sure that I was going to overrun on the time on stream and lo and behold, of course I have. So what I did earlier is I took one of these flowers off. As you can see, it ripped a little bit. Um, in fact, it doesn't look like it ripped. It looks like it was cut and placed in this way onto this strand of, of things. But here it is. This has also been ironed flat. And the reason I've done that is because I want to take a pattern. Oops. <laughs> My camera's just gone. That was no warning there. It's going to quickly change the battery. I think this is my last battery. Okay, once this battery dies, the stream is going to be over. <laughs> Is that focused? I've been having problems with my eyesight recently, hence trying to wear the glasses. But that means with the glasses, I can see close, but I can't see far away. So I can't see the computer screen, which is why I'm struggling to read the chat. And I can't see myself on the camera, which is about two meters away from me. So I don't know if I'm in focus. Hopefully everything's fine. My optician said to me, 
you know, you really should get two pairs of glasses. You should get one for reading and one for long distance. And I said, oh, well, you know, glasses are expensive. I'd rather only get one pair. And, and then he said, okay, fine. We'll get the one that, you know, you're doing lots of close up work. I told my optician I'm a milliner and he, he was, he said, I don't meet many milliners. <laughs> um, so I got the close up glasses, but it means when I'm wearing the close up glasses, I can't see far away. Anyway, um, let's take a pattern of this. I'm going to do it with a pen because I find a pen actually gives a thinner line than a pencil, unless you are my granddad and you sharpen pens, uh, you sharpen pencils with a pen knife. And I have never seen a pencil as sharp as my granddad can get it. And if my granddad's not sharpening my pencils, then I don't count my pencils as sharp enough to use. So we're going to use a pen to get a fine nib. And I'm just going to start tracing this. It doesn't have to be exact. These would have probably been die cut by machines. You know, sometimes you see those um, metal tools for flower making that like the really big ones that actually look like finished flower presses. That this flower looks to me like it was made with one of those. Design Painter says, I have to leave the live stream now, but this was a very informative and inspiring session. Looking forward to seeing your next online class. Cheers, have a pleasant Sunday. Thank you so much. I hope you have a pleasant rest of the day also. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with you all thinking this is a class. <laughs> I think if I was to teach a class, I'd be a lot more prepared than this. I do want to teach a class at some point, like a proper class, like a proper sign up class. I know I've been saying that for ages, but I just haven't gotten around to doing it. I have been writing a class. It's just, as I've said before, because it's just me, quite literally. Um, well, I mean, Mr. Hat helps, but it, it's pretty much just me. I'm trying to do 20 different jobs at the same time. And I do actually have, um, I don't have like a proper, proper job, but I do have a another thing that I do that I can't talk about. So, um, that also eats into my time. And yeah, that's that's been taking on a lot of time, the other thing that I do. I guess I can tell you what I do. It's in it's in social housing. Um but you know, social housing is very complex. Social housing is like council housing in the UK, so um people who need places to live but can't afford them the the logistics of that i talk to building people about if buildings are safe essentially that's the other thing i do um <laughs> but i don't i don't want to talk about that on on hats no we, we just talk about hats here hats and cats and tea but i do feel like i've had a lot on my plate recently so i am actually feeling a bit stressed I feel like it's come to the end of two hours and I'm starting to unravel a little bit. So we're going to finish up today. Um, so I've taken the pattern. This was the flower. You can still see, even though I've ironed it flat, you can see the veins in the flower. Um, what I'll do is I'll take off another one of these just, just to show you what it looked like before being... flattened out so here's a non-flattened out flower you see it's definitely been glued together over here it's been glued together so i'm going to and it's been glued together again in four petals so this is interesting this is now two flowers i've taken off the main oh i've lost a petal it'll be somewhere there it is this is now two flowers i've taken off the main stem and they've both been four petaled and I don't, oh, the fifth petal is over here underneath the leaf. So if I unfold this, I wonder if they're different sizes. So this is something that I will probably be doing, um, but I, I might do this bit off camera in time for the next live stream because it also seems to me that these are all um, either cut smaller or they are, um, 
it definitely looks like it was a five petaled one but it could be smaller so i'm actually now tempted to say that this strand was potentially one or two whole millinery flowers that were taken apart and then put onto this string so it would be very interesting to see when i take it all apart if all of these different petals are kind of going from larger petals to smaller petals because that would kind of indicate that they were part of one big flower or if they're all the same size then they are probably being made in a factory just from a flower press just however many there are here and i will count them later on and then yes there we go Yes, I think my concentration is starting to lap. I, I, I am impressed with how many of you are still watching online. <laughs> That's a very impressive concentration spam. A span. Oh dear. Yes, it's definitely time to, time to start winding down. I think for the evening. We'll come back to this in the next live stream. Um, I won't go too far ahead without filming it. I promise. Uh, the one last thing I will actually say before we move on is I can't figure out what fabric this is. It's going to be a natural fabric. So it's either cotton or a silk or even a rayon or a viscose or something. It's a little bit shiny, so we can probably rule out cotton. It could be a silk habitai. Um, I don't actually know exactly what silk habitai is, but I do have some silk habitai and I think it's the closest to this. And it definitely feels stiffened. If you've ever felt silk habitai without like any kind of millinery stiffener in it or anything like that, it's pretty much like a very cheap, it feels like a cheap acetate lining, but it is silk habitai and it's, it's used as linings, I think, in clothes. Um, and that's what these fibers here at the frayed edges of the leaf look like. They look like those kind of silk habitai fibers and the weave, if you really zoom in on it, it looks like a silk habitai like, that I have in my cupboard and I have stiffened it um, twice. Uh, where is it? Let me show you the stiffened silk and then, then I'll wrap up. And I didn't stiffen the silk very well. It's got some, um, some watermarks on it, which I don't know are going to come up on, on camera. I've stiffened this with two layers of my favorite stiffener, Futrex. If you've never heard of um, this stiffener company, they're European. I uh, did a video review of some PR that they sent me. So husband, could you find the Futrex stiffening video? I think it's called um, Revolutionary Stiffening Technique or something. It's the one where I'm holding up all the brushes in the thumbnail. Um, so if you want to learn more about that stiffener, do watch that video. Um, so I've stiffened this with two layers of this chemical Futrex stiffener. Obviously follow all the safety precautions, more information in the video, and you can see it's, you can hear it rustling. At least I hope you can hear that rustling. I don't know if the microphone picked that up. Hang on, let's try that again. There we go. It rustles when it's stiff, but it feels about the same stiffness as this petal does now. And obviously the petal looks yellower because it's older, and this is an ivory silk habitai. If it was optically white, it would be the color of the paper sheet. So there we go. I can see some questions have come in. Let's, I will answer this one last question and then I think it'll be time to clock off for the day. Uh, Laura says, have you ever used, oh, what a word. Papilnaceous ribbons, they look beautiful. It's a heritage trade to weaving silk ribbons. I'm going to look that up, considering I have no idea what that word is and have never seen that word in my life. I'm going to guess I haven't used that type of ribbon, but I will look it up and get back to you. Um, thank you for sharing the existence of beautiful heritage trades and things. That's, that's what the internet is for. We're for sharing lots of new things and ideas. And on that note, I think it's definitely time to wrap up. Um, thank you all so much for joining me and thank you for sticking to the end of the two hours. My goodness, I think I am um, I am impressed, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for watching. Uh, do consider liking this video and subscribing. Um, I, I would love for the YouTube videos to reach more people. 
Um, the more people watch my videos, the more viable it is for me to continue making videos. So if you know some millinery friends and they don't know about my channel, do let them know. Perhaps they'd like to watch. Um, yes, uh, do sign up to my newsletter. Newsletter. Uh, I'll leave it in the in the description box. The newsletter where you can sign up to that. All about hats. Uh, do come and meet me at my pop up shop in. Uh, next weekend in fact yes meet me at my pop-up shop next weekend in the sook shop in uh new malton street i think we said it was details somewhere i'll pop them in the pinned comment in a pinned comment later on um yes thank you so much for watching everyone <laughs> it's already it's it's always lovely to spend the sunday with you guys watching and um i love sharing all my projects with you because then it doesn't feel like I'm shouting into a millinery void and this is the point of the live streams. I love chatting. Um, so yes, thank you so much. And thank you for sticking around. Thank you for watching, liking and subscribing. And I'm being a bit too British now and saying thank you too much. So I will see you all next time. Bye.